Well, a very warm welcome, great to see you, and welcome to another edition of My Body the Guitar with Carla Lynn Merrifield. Great to see you, Carla. Oh, you too, Paul. Hello, everyone. So today, uh, George Harrison, uh, Carla. Yeah, yeah. Exciting. I mean, when I was a, when I was a, a teeny bopper, I, um, I, of course, you know, it was like, oh, it's Paul. He's so cute. You know, this is back when they first, you know, hit hit the scene. And, and you know, and then for a while, maybe I was into George. Uh, but I really didn't come to appreciate George Harrison um, until I was very much an adult. Um, and to me, um, he, he as talented uh, singer songwriters as John and Paul are, and Ringo as a drummer, I, I think that George Harrison is the uh, greatest musician of the of the four Beatles. Yeah. So, you know, opinions, right? <laughs> Well, I think, I mean, and, and the thing is, there are no right and wrong opinions. That That's the whole thing about opinion, isn't it? Yeah. I, I mean, for, for me, George Harrison was one of the most tasty musicians of all time. Everything he played was absolutely, yeah. even if it was improvised, it was kind of measured and perfect, I think. You know, he he, he doesn't get mentioned as a guitar hero per se very much, mm -hmm. not in the way, way of Clapton and um, Hendrix, but... Um, such a beautiful touch on the guitar and an enormous influence on people. Um, you know, when you think of, of, of people that he'd worked with since then, um, his solo stuff then, of course, with the Traveling Wilburys and, and a lot of, um, you know, the charity work he did and stuff like that, and of course, funding Life of Brian, which was another, uh, you know, the, right. another, another great uh, achievement. Um, uh, he's he's one, right. of the great, one of the greatest of all time, you know. Um, but this, this well, poem... Yeah. I'd, love, I'd love to hear this poem, Carla. Can you tell us a bit about it? Okay. Um, I, I wrote this uh, at the time that I was <clears throat> learning to play Let It Be. And you'll hear, you know, I mean, that's in the title, uh, There Will Be an Answer. Um, and, and, you know, and, and I fully real. I mean, I was writing it. Um, and uh, so I'm learning how to play the song. And I'm doing it uh, during COVID times, okay, at the very beginning. And I was practicing on my on my lanai here in Florida uh, that April. And I got it, I got the song down close enough that I actually stood up and played it out facing out my lanai to the condo world. <laughs> in front of me and, and played it for uh, my neighbors who might be listening. Anyway, so it was probably my first performance <laughs> to an invisible audience, but, um, and you know, rudimentary as my playing is, or as certainly was then. Anyway, and I sat there afterwards and I thought about the song, you know, and the combination of being um, stuck in, in, in the bizarro COVID world um, and and the lyrics of the song and the, and the music of it and how and um, and and this poem happened uh, then and there just boom 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 um, so let me let me read it for you and and for our uh, viewers it's called there will be an answer fantastic is the fear of the night our original fear or did early hominids fear starvation more or did our ancestors fear most the loss of their most beloveds what's in a misstrung love song what's in a misstrummed poem what's in my cave wall paintings mistakes? What's in my petroglyph chiselings in the stone to your bones? And how far and how long do we have to wait for the music 
and the lyrics to come along and lift us up and onto George Harrison's strings. We will evolve and if not, somehow solve it all. We will, by firelight, eventually learn how to let it be. Well, I've said this every time we've done these, Carla, and that is just breathtaking. I totally think it's incredible. The, the, um, I've got so many questions to okay, ask you about. Okay, let's it. go. Almost line by line. Um, so the first line, Carla, we just call this line by line because it's, it's, it's gold. So the first line. In the fear of, is the fear of the night our original fear? <clears throat> mm. So what 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 type of angle were you coming at when you when you were writing this? Um, I had I you know I was trying to recall that I had either had a text or an email or a phone discussion with a dear friend of mine, and and we were you know the whole you know, you know being you know launched in, into COVID world, um, and and the fear that came with that because we knew so little back then. Um, and we still don't know everything, of course, but, um, and, and there, you know, that whole, the vibe of the fear, like, am I going to catch this thing? Am I going to give it to somebody? What, you know, so we were talking, texting, emailing, whatever it was, um, about fear. And, uh, and it came up, you know, it, is that man's original, uh, uh, you know, the fear of the night when, you know, where, where men were, you know, men and women and, and families were sitting around their, their fire pit in their caves or rudimentary shelters. Um, was it fear of the night that was the worst? And, and the thing, you know, and here we've got a song, you know, that has the lyrics, there will be an answer, let it be. And the, and the funny thing about the poem is, as we'll find as we talk further, I mean, there are eight questions in this sonnet it's a modern sonnet um eight questions packed into this uh you know 14 line uh, verse and the, you know the, so the discussion just what you know started me off in this you know what what is our original fear um and i just you know kept rolling with it can i can i just uh, backtrack a little yeah. bit kind of for, for the benefit of myself sure. and everybody uh, everybody else who doesn't know um what is a sonnet oh well there's there's several uh, forms of sonnets are Shakespearean and Petrarchan, and those are the traditional uh, forms that, you know, 14 lines, it's usually uh, uh, three stanzas of four, and then a closing couplet, and and with with both the Shakespearean and Petrarchan, there, you know, it has to be uh, a certain meter and a, and a certain rhyme pattern, so like with Shakespearean, um, you know, A, B, whatever, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, you know, you, the words at the end of the lines, the rhyme pattern. Um, and, uh, and and Shakespearean was uh, iambic pentam pentameter. So you had to have, you know, uh, the, those two syllable beat, five beats of two syllables, five feet of two syllables each. So it, you know, a lot of rules. Um, uh, and then the modern sonnet that has evolved since then, and, and these forms are always evolving, is much looser. Uh, I mean, you know, free verse came, you know, uh, blank verse came along, and then free verse came along, and now we've got, um, you know, not only free verse, but you've got these these looser uh, rules. So basically, now we're down to okay, it's fourteen lines, it's a sonnet. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, it's much more uh, lackadaisical. Uh, and this, the poem itself, this one has um, has the standard uh, four, you know, three um, stanzas of, of four lines and then the closing couplet. But other than that, it's pretty, you know, so wingy. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> this second line's got uh, got words in that I don't actually know what they mean, actually, because I say I've looked at this and I wanted to ask, I didn't want to look at it myself, I wanted to ask you. Could okay. you just give us the second line, Carla? And, and, okay, and, all right. Is the fear of the night our original fear? And then the second line, or did early hominids fear starvation more? So it's hominids that uh, I, I have no clue. Mm. Yeah, um, before we became um, what we are now, homo sapiens sapiens, 
Um, there, our ancestors were classified, you know, they weren't quite human yet. You know, you'll hear uh, anthropologists talk, talk about Australopithecus um, and, and those kindred ancient, ancient um, humans that were just starting to get upright, um, had some of the basic features of what we recognize as human today. You know, their the, the greater brain capacity, so higher, higher skull, you know, higher score, uh, foreheads so that mm. the brain could fit in the skull. Um, and we gradually, you know, we went from bent over, you know, to, to bipedal upright. <clears throat> so the hominids are just, it's a word for the group of, of different species that led up to, um, that were human-like, but not yet what we, we think of as, as human today. Mm. And scientifically and genetically, you know, I mean, they've got all the genes for all these uh, ancients that they found the bones for uh, and are able to, to tell us, you know, determine what, uh, what they were composed of uh, in terms of their DNA. So hominids, early man. Thank you very much. And so could, could we, this next, the, the last two lines in the, in the first, um, first stanza, uh, uh, Carla, um, could you just give us those, please? Yes, or did our ancestors fear most the loss of their most beloveds? Mm. So were we more afraid of, of, of the dark, of starving, or, you know, was our, our number one fear losing our husband or wife or, I mean, we, probably they, those family units didn't use those terms, but were our children I mean, you know, those early days uh, were pretty precarious. So, and and I thought, you know, yeah, fear of night, of hunger. No, I mean, are we, didn't we fear that we were going to lose our loved ones all mm. the time, you know? Mm. Uh, the one one thing I, I was going to ask you is is the the um, uh, let it be as a song and a lot of things like here come the sun of course he wrote here come the sun you know something the way she moves while my guitar gently weeps my sweet lord mm-hmm. he kind of a lot of his music is so um, spiritual spiritually uplifting yeah. I think and was that an influence with this poem absolutely mm. uh, I mean I mean it's I mean that was the whole point no matter what. Um, how bumbling uh, we uh, humans are, uh, even having evolved as, as far as we have, and, and having all kinds of, of creative um, uh, tendencies. I mean, we've been creating since those, uh, you know, uh, cave days. Uh, you know what? You know, can we can we get beyond that? Even if we're not evolving now. Um, can we learn to be in the moment and let it be um, to put, in other words, put to me, the lyric, the song, let it be, <clears throat> which is so uplifting. And, and like I said, him like um, that, even if, if we haven't evolved far enough that we will be able to figure out a way um, that we can relax from our fears uh, and 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 let the moment be, let it be, and and move on to the to the next moment. I mean, it's kind of quasi, you know, kind of Buddhist in a way um, well, when you think about was, it. Uh, he, he, I think he, he was. He did, he certainly studied um, Indian uh, cultures, and I'm not sure whether he wasn't a Buddhist. Actually, I'm not sure about that. I must check that up. But, yeah, I uh, don't either. But it's certainly, I think. You know, I mean, he didn't. He. He didn't write the song, but boy, that that solo uh, that George has in, in the middle of that of the song. Um, I mean, talk about, you know, just, uh, you know, lifting you up mm. and then you come to the, you know, the the end of the song and the and the whole. Yeah, there will be an answer. You know, chill out, dudes. There will be an answer <laughs> and let it be. I think that's what one thing that that reading through the poem that that it came to my mind it, it reinforced in my mind George Harrison's work actually bar none all of his work 
his guitar solos were part of the composition. It wasn't a medley of my greatest lick. It was kind of, <laughs> you know, if you think if you think to let it be, um, while well, my guitar, oh, and the Clapton played on that in the original, but I've heard it played many times, you know, and his stuff later on, it's all part of the music. I think it, that's one of the reasons he doesn't get the plaudits that he did is because he's so musical. And there's no kind of, look at me, I can do this. You know, there's no, there's there's no element in George Harrison's music where he says, "I've practiced this. Now you need to hear it," which which right. does surface in certain, you know, areas, and that's part of that music. But um, you know, um, I was going to ask you, kind of, before we get onto this second verse, was actually Shakespeare an influence for this poem in terms of of the the type of oh. flavor you were looking for? Oh, I think yeah, I well yeah, because I think you know. You can't, if you're a poet, you can't not be in, uh, influenced by Shakespeare. And I think even if you're sitting and writing a modern sonnet in all its, you know, loose, uh, looseness of form, uh, you, know, you know, Shakespeare's there behind you. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things about, uh, about uh, Shakespeare and especially, you know, the sonnets is that he wasn't afraid of, of writing about the big topics, uh, love, uh, death, um, fear, longing, um, you know, the, the really core uh, human emotions. And I think so that anytime, and even if it's not a sonnet, I think, you know, for English, English speaking and writing poets, Shakespeare is always there. Um, he he's part of a part of our DNA, um, you know, as much as, as oh, geez, I can't think of any other writer that probably dominates the the English language like Shakespeare. So, yeah, he was there. I mean, I'm talking about fear, um, you know, one of the biggest uh, elements of human existence. And <clears throat> and I think so. Shakespeare's there um, mm -hmm. hang around. Saying, okay, you can do this. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> this, this next, the, could you could just um, um, go through the next uh, verse, kind of, it, possibly in in its entirety, because it, it, it's so, so beautiful. The whole thing just flows so perfectly. Okay. What's in a missung love song? What's in a misstrummed poem? What's in my cave wall paintings mistakes? What's in my petroglyph chiselings in the stone to your bones? So um, I'm acknowledging how human we all are. We make mistakes. Um, and so if we, we we're trying to sing a love song and it's missung, or we're trying to write a poem and we misstrum it. In other words, we get the rhythm off or something mm -hmm. um, or the wrong word. All right. So we do. And what if we're, we're drawing on, our, we were drawing in ancient times as hominids on our cave walls or cavern walls um, you know, uh, pictures of deer in the hunt and, and um, deer, you know, the animals that surrounded us in our early days. Uh, and, you know, so <laughs> and you make a mistake on the, on the cave wall, all right, you make a mistake. Um, and the same thing with a petroglyph uh, when you're painting, a, a painting on a, on a, a cavern wall, um, some creature or a symbol of the river or something. Yes, you know, so the, 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 the ochre at the end of your, of your paintbrush, I mean, they did, early man did, you know, create the tools to, to carve and, and paint those walls. Uh, so you make a mistake, you know, uh, cause I think people, that's one of the, actually that this stands on thinking about it, Paul, is, is probably about um, that whole, another fear that we all have. And that's the fear of, of making um, mistakes. Um, and certainly artists, and that's, this is about uh, art, you know, songs and, and poems and paintings and chiselings. Um, you know, we're so afraid of making mistakes that we get um, frozen. And you and I've talked about this during lessons. I mean, you're a guitar mm. teacher. 
you know, a mistake is, tell me, what is it that you say? Well, it's it's, it's just uh, uh, further on the path to learning how to do it, how you want to do it. It's a mistake is just a miss take you know it's not the end of the world you know in certainly not in music anyway um so a a mistake is actually meaning that it's not actually been absorbed totally yet and that's just that's just a a matter of time to absorb it and make it right but if if people don't make mistakes they don't learn anything right because if it's you know nobody gets a perfect take first time because it wouldn't be perfect you know so it's in i was one thing i was going to ask you about this verse carla is that looking through the poem um um, with George Harrison's work, um, you could certainly hear his influences of rock and roll, of um, some Indian music, of course. He had a lot of rock and roll, so, some, some of the rockabilly, the jazz, that type of thing. Um, in this poem, is, is, there, is there an influence of your f- previous work with, um, with Lith- Lithic Scatter and y- y- your books where, you, where you've kind of gone back and written about uh, you know, primitive um, yes. you know, America? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I've had, I've had, I've been curious about uh, like l- the caves at Lascaux, uh, the cave paintings at Lascaux um, since I was a, a child. Um, and I, you know, I had somebody, some smart, you know, uncle or I don't know, my parents maybe, you know, gave me a book that had, um, that was about uh, cave paintings and their discovery and history, uh, you know, but written for a you know a young person, and I was just fascinated. And then having traveled then here uh, in the United States and Canada to see uh, sites of our early peoples and their cave cave drawings, and just I mean that the 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 creative impulse has been with us since the beginning. And I, for some reason, George Harrison, um, as a musician, somehow makes me reach back in deep time to, to, to our her early ancestors and then look forward at the same time to the future. Um, it's the strangest thing. I mean, he's, it may, and maybe this is his, um, training and studies uh, in India that that bubble up into bubbled up into his music and his life that he then was able to translate for listeners and it's maybe totally subliminal, but to me it's there, and he's you know just he sends me back and he moves me forward at the same time. Uh, when I hear his music, mm. I, I, I could have just, uh, just, just for, for definition wise, uh, um, uh, pe- petroglyph chiseling up is that ancient, ancient, um, ch- uh, um, a- ancient way of, of, of doing cave paintings? Yes. Right. So the, the pic- pictographs were painted on cave walls and petroglyphs were carved. So, right. so a petroglyph. Uh, petro meaning um, the root word uh, meaning stone. So um, ancient folks were were actually taking um, you know harder substances than the sandstone or whatever they were carving in and actually chiseling out um, you know spirals and waves of rivers and that kind of thing. So they actually yeah they chipped away at the stone to get. Um, to get their picture to to right. emerge, yeah. So yeah. on on to the third verse, uh, Carlo. I'm I'm going to ask you about the the, the first um, two lines. Could could you just describe what's between the the, the those the, the two lines in the third verse stanza? Three. Actually, I think I, what I'll do, Paul, is the three lines because it's one question that that okay. covers. It's the longest mm. question in the poem, and it's the last question in the poem. And how far and how long do we have to wait? for the music and the lyrics to come along to lift us up and onto George Harrison's strings. Mm. Beautiful. I mean, so it, it, this, this, this two aspects that I, I thought to the, the first aspect I thought to, to, when I read this is the fact that um, Beatles were on Ed Sullivan in 1964, I think it was 64. Yes. And that changed the world for some 
I haven't read an interview of a, of a guitar player after 1964 from the North American continent that hasn't quoted that as a turning point in their career. Absolutely. Jimi Hendrix, for instance, um, watched them on the Ed Sullivan show, sat on the set he, in one of the books, sat on the set with the Isley Brothers watching watching Hendrix, uh, watching the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. And this is George Harrison strings. That's a really interesting thing for me because George Harrison is is not, again, we, he's very underplayed as, as a great, but I don't think there's any guitar player actually that, that, that picked up an electric guitar that hasn't played one of his phrases. I, I really think that he's, he's, he's so, so much part of the fabric and and positivity. I, I, whenever I think of George Harrison's music, I always think it's positive, right up to the um, the tribute concert that uh, Jeff Lynne oh, and Tom yeah. Petty did. You know, yeah. and, um, you know, could you just talk about a bit about that, those, those three lines there, Carla? Well, I think this goes back, this goes back to for me to... Um, again, his th that quiet spirituality that he had, um, and certainly for me, one of the perhaps the most this is go this is really going out on a limb, but one of the most iconic songs of the twentieth and maybe well into the twenty first century is while my guitar gently weeps mm. okay and i think that that song and the concept of a guitar being able to express uh that it can weep i mean it can do i mean just, just if it can weep it can do a lot of you know other emotions mm. uh mm. you know joy um, you know, about fear. I mean, you can feel so much, but he, George Harrison, when he, my, my guitar gently weeps, he made us understand um, the power of an instrument, of course, in the right hands um, to, to be able to express um, human emotion mm. and, and, and the guitars have voices and we're, it's up to us, you know, playing them to to release that voice. Uh, so I think that that, you know, I just like I said, that to me is the most iconic um, song I can think of of the modern era. And it was because he he, he got the idea of of the power of music, especially, you know, my guitar um, to express um, human emotion and, 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 you know, specifically, of course, you know, the, uh, our, our profound sadness, weeping, not just crying, weeping. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that undergirds um, this question um, that, you know, the, I starting off with fear and talking about our ancient ancestors and, you know, implying, you know, our evolution and everything that he, you know that's where we we want to be and that's how we can find the answer is to to get into that whole concept you know the mind frame of of being with him in a song and getting up onto his strings and being part of that power to gently weep totally i i totally get that kind i mean uh on on guitar kind of weeping um is it's kind of dis I mean, to turn this up a second and put some reverb on. Hang on yeah. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. So, uh, it's this type of, I think. That, maybe that type of thing. I'm not sure. Let me check the reverb off a second. That's it. Um, while my guitar gently weeps, it, it, very clever bit of writing. Well, they all, they all the Beatles songs are, because he he picked a chord progression. I think it's in this key. And what happens is is that it's it's a minor chord. It starts off, and I think it's it's I think it's a C minor. And he uses a classic. Um, um, a descending light, so it goes major. Uh, sorry, minor. Then he has this clash in it. 
about this dissonance. This is used on, on Stairway to Heaven afterwards, but my funny Valentine, George Gershwin, Summertime, all use this type of... The voices, the, the voices in, the mi- in the middle descending. It's really interesting how he does that. He gets the tension in the middle of the chord. Now, he didn't invent that type of thing. That's been going on for centuries. Um, but it's such a, an iconic song uh, by Guitar Gently, which for many, many different reasons, I think. Um, and then, of course, it goes into a major key in the chorus, so it uplifts in the chorus. Um, and it's it's it, it again, I've, for me, with all these guitar players we're talking about, all these musicians, is that they're great enablers because they enable people. They they push the bar so high. George Harrison, I, I like I say, is responsible for inspiring billions of people to play the guitar. I think I really think billions because anywhere in the world, every everybody has heard of the Beatles. Um, you know, and uh, and the way he played is absolutely it was just total music i think and that his his indian studies certainly had a massive influence on him because um with indian classical music which is what he was studying i, I do believe that um there's a lot of improv- improvisation in, involved and it's a very very high standard of playing and there are you all virtuosos um and it's much more part of the daily life. A raga can go on for f- up to four, five hours possibly, and people are totally immersed in it. There's not so much of the. Um, uh, so I think what 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 he brought into the world is the fact that a lot of people studied Indian music after George Harrison. I'm not saying he was the first, but I think he heard Ravi Shankar, if I'm not mistaken. Oh yeah, oh, and- yeah. I mean, he was really. It wasn't single-handed, but he was hugely. George was hugely responsible for introducing Ravi Shankar to the to the Western world. Um, mm. I, and <laughs> if if anybody who studies, I, I studied Indian music myself, and I adore it. I think it's incredible. However, wh- one of the things you, you when you when you study Indian music is that. Um, it's 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 the nuance of the sound that the beautiful sound that, that they get and be, because indie music ha- in in western music we've got 12 notes on the on on, on the um, in in the western scale indie music has 22 <laughs> um yeah <laughs> 22 c- c- kind of what we call quarter notes so they kind of instead of going That type, that type type of aspect, and I think while while George Harrison w- was was still playing you know rock and roll a, a lot with the Beatles, that influence of brilliance and there's a lot of discipline involved in indie music as well. I mean, there's no kind of, I mean, there's no kind of there's no kind of showboat in in, in indie music at all. I mean, you know, you can you can't play a sitar down on your knees in front of a screen without guitar amplifier. It's all about the music, and I think the discipline that he did he did. And then people after him, uh, Pete Townsend studied with it uh, with a guru. Santana studied with a guru. John McLaughlin took it to the nth degree, um, and he enabled people to really be much more aware. Certainly for me, as um, aware of um, Eastern cultures of, of of Indian cultures and the brilliance that goes with that. I remember seeing um, Monterey Pop Festival video. Jimi Hendrix, I, I watched it because I love Jimi Hendrix, as we all do. And Ravi Shankar was on beforehand. I presume Ravi Shankar was on, you know, George Harrison would have had, or the Beatles would have had something to do with that, publicising the Indian music. And people were loving it, you know, and it's this such a, he's such a great enabler to bring, and he, he almost did for Indian music what um, the, the rock and roll players did for the blues, I think. There was kind of a research. Oh, interesting, yeah. A kind of resurgence, I think, of people um, like myself thinking, "Wow, the, this Indian music's amazing." And then once once you're influenced, once once you get into Indian music, it's it's a lifestyle. It's not really, you know, it it you you carry it with you everywhere you go, and it's it's a very much a spiritual music and a very uplifting music, and it's something that takes the audience with them. So um, I know the Beatles didn't play live very much, but certainly. In, in the times we played cover versions, myself and Catherine played cover versions, and we play a, a George uh, a, a George Harrison song or a Beatles song, there is a definite uplifting feeling about the whole thing. There will be an answer. Let it be, you know. And I think that's something you 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 c- captured so beautifully with this. Could could you give us the last two lines, Carla, of, of the uh, sure. Point? 
um, I'll do the last three lines coming out of the end of the third mm. uh, stanza because uh, this is uh, the questions are over. I've asked all my questions, <laughs> and my and then I give my reader um, the answer. Uh, my answer. Okay, we will evolve, and if not, somehow solve it all. We will by firelight learn eventually how to let it be. Mm. Beautiful. Um, that that phrase for me, I, I'm thinking um, not just about George Harrison's music, but his dedication to to the arts. Because um, uh, for the life of Brian, uh, EMI were going to back the life of Brian. They they, they were going to pay for it all. The last minute, they dropped out. Like that, they were going to fly out Monday morning. <laughs> And they kind of dropped out that weekend because of the pressure they were getting from various, um, so various um, societies, shall we say? Um, so George Harrison, uh, I've I've read this on a couple of occasions. Actually, remortgaged his house so he could fund the film. Wow, I and didn't actually, know that. He's in it. He's in the film as well. He, he's in. He's, he's in. Oh the God, film. I have to go back and watch it. <laughs> he, he's in the scene uh, where. Um, <laughs> Brian's been led through, um, led through a crowd of crowds of people, and he's, you know, he's he's the Messiah, and and George Harrison's in it. I can send you the the if you go on YouTube, you'll be you'll definitely see it. Okay. He doesn't he have have a line. He just goes Ugh, and pushes him out of the way. <laughs> but I think that the, and for, see, for, very primal, very ancient hominid of him. <laughs> well, if he hadn't <laughs> backed the film, it, it wouldn't have got made. And for, I mean, for me, life for. I'm a huge Monty Python fan. I think Life of Brian's the one of the greatest documentaries of all time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Phil. <laughs> um, and it, it's it's it's. I think that was his. Even though he had all, loads of money and loads of fame and stuff, he still was still looking for more. Like with the Traveling Wilburys later on with um, yeah. Bob Dylan. Was it Bob Dylan, Tom Petty, Roy Orbison, Jeff Lynne, George Harrison? I mean, that is an insane amount of. Um, Talent. talent yeah i mean that's yeah. just but the fact that they all could get on and make great music right you know and um i think th th what the thing that comes from me with this this poem Carla, is is that it's it, it the spirituality of what george harrison was doing is summed up perfectly and every time i go back to listen to his music i just think yeah this is this is fine this is there will be an answer you know life's better with the beatles and yeah the life is yeah you know i mean it's, still i mean you know, um, well, but I and, and going back to Paul, if thinking as you were talking about the the Indian influence and how, um, you know, the Indian music and the whole I mean, yeah, besides the 22, 20, a, a scale of, of 22 uh, just blows me away. But and how long they went on and on and on. Hmm. I, I mean, it's almost that music uh, is almost trance like hmm. um, and takes you. Um, into um, uh, like a meditative uh, where, you know, thoughts fall away and you are just there. I mean, without, you know, the, this what I call squirrel brain running around your brain, um, the, this thought to this thought to that thought that the listening to uh, Indian music uh, you go into a kind of trance and I think the performers do as well. And they're just so it's just the music. That's all there is. Um, there's no distractions. And I think, you know, that influence on George, then that he carried then inside him um, had to come out in, in how he played. Uh, and his approach, uh, his evolving approach to to um, performing and writing, you know, when he went off on his on his own um, and and continued to to create. So, you know, it's. I, it, I, I it's totally agree with that, Connor. I think what, what one of the aspects of Indian music also is that um, you you that there is a there is a certain gymnastics aspect to the guitar where people play a lot of notes and it's kind of wow he plays george harrison never got into that type of musical arms race but some people do get into that fast right. type of playing however one of the aspects of indian music is that that's taken as a given as part of the technique so it's not like oh this is a really fast lick it's like it's not it's part of the music and, and that's the thing is that 
uh, often the audiences are as clued up as almost as clued up as the musicians you know because there's mm. certain climaxes that the improvisation um reaches and and the audience explode in 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 a, in a you know a, a, a feat of appreciate you know a sound of appreciation and one of the aspects that i, I just be just kind of to finish up maybe is is the fact i think the beatles ach achieve the same level of devotion because everybody knows well, if you go see a Beatles tribute or you, you watch a Paul McCartney concert or a Beatles concert or any of those, or a George Harrison concert, everybody knows every beat of every song. And that's one of the aspects. It's not just that, and we, we've said this before, it's not just the beat of every song, where you were when you heard it, right. what you were wearing, who you were with, you know, and that's that's one of the brilliant legacy of the of, of these people and, and the guitar enables people to do that i think really you know i mean when you first i was going to get kind of uh, not really related right to the point but when you first heard the beatles where were you oh um my brother uh who's five years was five years older than i am uh brought home um the first album um and i was 11 64 yeah 60 12 okay um and he put it on our family's stereo mm. um, and of course my parents were appalled what is that you know and look at those guys with the long hair like long hair <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so i was in the i was in the living room uh by uh, at home um as a t you know a teeny bopper and my brother was a little dismissive of the songs. He was like, he was such a folky. Um, but I mean, I was like, oh my God, these guys are unbelievable. Uh, so that was the first time. And then, and then he took, it was his album. He took it away, you know, tucked it in his room, whatever. Um, and the next time was the Ed Sullivan. The second time, I remember the second time, was the Ed Sullivan show. Um, and the whole family, you know, was sitting around for Ed Sullivan. So on Sunday night, and, oh, my God, yes. <laughs> I think so. I think that, that Ed Sullivan show, I, I, I'm going to stick my neck out. I think it's, I would say it's, it's as influential as the moon landings because that is so iconic because every music, so many careers were launched on that show in terms of people watching it thinking i want to do that joe perry um you know um so uh, eddie van halen all these great 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 sure. musicians billy gibbons all these great people think i want to do that and it's like you know and the thing is unlike the moon landings the guitar is accessible if you want to go to the moon <laughs> you know it's it's tricky um but if if you if you wanted to play guitar that is the moment that's the light bulb moment for millions of people throughout the world and not just them it's the people they influence so the beatles are st i think the beatles are still as in influential now as they were then you oh know, i believe it i believe it i mean yeah. i hear young uh i run into young people um you know who are in college i live at, a, at home i live in a college town and and um, I'm always, so I'm always running into it. I know, you know, professors who introduce me to their young students and, and yeah, I mean, the Beatles are still, I, you can't not listen to the Beatles. Mm. Uh, do, do, do you think, Carla, in terms of, of literature, in ter I mean, it's a bit of a leap, but w w would you say they're part of, of, of the, I'm, I'm thinking in the terms of, of the, like, British type of uh, literature history with Shakespeare and Wordsworth, Wordsworth and and, um, and and all those type of people. Do you think that the Beatles are kind of in that lineage, in in a different way? In a different way, uh, maybe not so much um, lyrically. Uh, although you might argue that the White Album approaches um, higher literature, some of the lyrics on on the White Album, but. Um, but yeah, in terms of the influence, uh, absolutely. Mm. I, they're part of our, and, and it's worldwide. I mean, you've been around the world, Paul, you and yeah. Catherine yeah. and, and, it, and the, and the, the Beatles phenomenon is worldwide. Uh, so you can walk into, you can walk into a, um, a shack restaurant in, 
in Sri Lanka and, and, and hear the Beatles being piped in over, over the sounds, you know, the little scratchy sound system. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, uh, they're everywhere and they always will be. Uh, and people will, and people will, especially, especially women, we will argue. Oh no, it's Paul. Oh no, it's John. Oh no, it's George. Oh, well, Ringo, you know, I mean, it's, they're eternal. They're eternal and ubiquitous everywhere on the planet. And, and I think forever. Actually, um, it's, it's funny you should say, say Sri Lanka because I, ironically, I did a gig in Sri Lanka. I was there for about three months. Uh, oh. And I did hear Sri Lankan bands playing Beatles songs. There and you go. It, yeah, it, it it's incredible. And also, I think um, it's the fact that it enabled a lot of people to learn English. Yes. Yes. You know, um, I know we 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 we, we, we both uh, got, uh, meet up on on Tuesday on Tuesdays on the zoo, on on Zoom for the for the guitar stuff. And and I remember you know talking to um, uh, Karl Heinz and um, Thomas from Germany and in, in, in our Zoom sessions. And, you know, a lot of people learn English from, from listening to the, you know, you would want to know how that, what it means. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's, it's incredible. This, this is just yeah. such a beautiful poem. I, I, feel, I feel really good. I, I always feel great after these sessions. This is like, you know, this is high for me because I'm, you know, there will be an answer, especially in 2020. We're in 2021 yeah. now. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, there will be an answer and it's, it's yes. fantastic. And <laughs> we're finding we're and it's, you know, we're finding the answer all the time uh because there are so many questions and we're always fine you know we keep that's the uh, the human impulse we want the answer and whether it's in research on uh coronavirus vaccines um or uh what you know new new ways of um of uh, production uh, you know high-end production to make an automobile, we're always, you know, we're, that's, that's what it's, it is part of what it is to be human. We ask questions and we, we seek answers. Uh, that's what this religion is about. We want answers to things and sometimes we have to invent them, but, um, you know, it's just, a, it's a human impulse. And that's, you know, really at the core of this poem, it has to do with, with how, how we are, what we are as humans. And John yeah. and George Harrison, um, I think, just you know, keeps opening those doors uh, to this day with his music. Mm. Unlike, you know, I don't know, unparalleled. Brilliant. Let's put it that way. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Carla, for such a beautiful, uh, beautiful forty-five minutes. That that's been brilliant to to discuss this beautiful poem. And uh, there'll be another 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 session soon. Yes, thank you. Absolutely, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go pick up my acoustic guitar um, and play "Let It Be." Excellent. Well, that sounds great. Thank yeah. you so much, Carla. Brilliant. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you, Paul. Thank you. And everyone. <laughs>